Okay, guys, the last talk of the workshop, last but not least. Um, so we actually don't have a break in the schedule. Uh, the, the break the, is after the talk. After the talk, permanent break. Uh, okay, so uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Patrick Lam. Patrick, uh, his in research interests are in uh, program analysis, dynam uh, static dynamic analysis, test case generation, uh, applications of, of uh, PL software engineering. Uh, he got his PhD at uh, MIT with Martin Rinard, and then moved on to become a professor at the University of Waterloo, where he is now an associate professor. He's actually spending a sabbatical here at ETH with us. And uh, yeah, so we're happy to have him. Go ahead. Thanks, Martin. My goal today is to advocate for using test cases in dynamic and static analysis. And so the talk is going to be like this. I'm going to do some advocacy. And then in the middle, I'm going to talk about one thing I did where I actually analyzed test cases. And then I'm going to go and do some more advocacy at the end. All data, right? I'm trying to get bigger. So to start, I was thinking, well, what, do we, what are we doing with programs? Why do we analyze programs? And so this is just going back to what we do with programs and static analysis and dynamic analysis. And I remember the first time I thought about analyzing programs, it was like people were like, OK, you got these programs, that are, and they're slow, and you got compilers, and you want to try to do program analysis so that you can make the program faster. We can step back and say that's, in general, program transformation. And we can talk about both automatic program transformation as we do in compilers, or we can talk about a more software engineering -y kind of look at the program and guiding manual transformations of the program help the programmer do these transformations. So that's one thing that you can do with, with program analysis. Another thing you can do, these two things are kind of related, but I put them on separate bullets. You can look at the program, and you can try to eliminate bugs. So that's sort of a transformation. But looking for bugs is not really a transformation. And you can ensure software quality. I wanted to put that one last, because it's kind of like what we use test suites for more than program transformation. But in general. We do program analysis so that we can make the program faster, or we can make the program better in some way. Right. So usually we have these programs, and it's very common that programs do come with gobs of tests. And then kind of like when we try to do analysis on the programs, we like forget about these tests. But they're there. And there's a lot of tests, too. So here are some small data. And so there's like 10 benchmark programs. And so how much tests are there? In the programs I looked at, these are some random Java programs I looked at. They're moderately sized. Uh, some programs have about 0.3 lines of tests per line of, line of code. And some other programs have 0 0.03 lines. But in general, they have tens of thousands of lines of tests. And so there's all this information that we can use. We can leverage this information in terms of both static and dynamic analysis. And we're not leveraging that right now. And tests are built into our, not quite our languages for the most part, but they're certainly libraries that are very close to the, to the language and they're in broad use. You know, you have these very popular unit testing libraries that people will always use when they try to make software and they try to make it right. So JUnit is probably the most popular one. And there's also XUnit for X, various values of X as well, but you know. A unit is super popular. And so I'd like to talk a bit about what tests do and why I think they're super useful to look at in terms of program analysis. So tests happen to in encode in terms of executable code how you can execute the program that you're that the, the test is trying to, to execute. So there's all sorts of setup and it tells you exactly what setup you need to run the program. And also, the test tells you what the program is supposed to do. And often, in static analysis, what we do is we say, OK, the simplest kind of static analysis is like, OK, the program should not explode, right? It should not have a null pointer exception. It should not. And those are very simple properties. But when we try to get more sophisticated properly, properties, that's quite difficult. And yet, here, there's these tests. And these tests say, look, the developer thinks that if you do the sequence of actions, then this thing should happen, right? And that's encoded in a way that the computer can understand. And if we're smart in writing program analyses, we can also understand as well. 
And so I think that this is a huge opportunity. We should be able to somehow leverage test suites in program analysis. I think they agree with me out there. <laughs> so let me talk a bit. So I did a, some some I did some looking into types of related work, and I don't think people really look at the test suites that come with programs as a source of data for program behavior. And so let me start by talking about static analysis in general and the limitations of st uh, static analysis. So some people have the soundiness manifesto where they point out, look, even analyses that we, we, we advertise as being sound, for the most part, they aren't actually sound. And there's reasons like um, in Java, you have reflection. And so you're going to load things based on strings in the program text or in the input or in the configuration file. And you could make approximations of that. If you make the most general approximation, you're going to make your analysis useless. Um, you can spend a lot of effort making more um, sophisticated guesses about what the class you're going to load is going to be. But it's, in general, it's quite difficult. And you shouldn't expect to have something that's necessarily going to be really actually sound. In C and C++, you can manufacture pointers. And so you can say your analysis is sound, but that doesn't say, well, what if you cast five to, um, to a pointer and try to dereference that? So there are soundiness limitations in terms of static analysis. And usually when we say we have a sound, of sound static analysis anyway, we don't have that. When we have dynamic analysis, then what happens is that we're, re we're restricted to knowing about the particular path that the input takes through the program. Maybe if we're smart, we can generalize that to the related paths, and we can get a bit of information about what the program does in general. But it's still some sort of limited view of what the program can do. That's kind of like you drive on the highway in California, and there's these big trees, and they're like, yeah, there's these cool big trees, but then they actually log the big trees, and like kind of like three trees in back of those big trees, they log all the big trees. And so from the highway, it's like, oh, yeah, these trees are great, but then you know they're actually not there. So dynamic analysis, you can definitely get fooled by being on a certain path through the program and not on other paths. <coughs> and you can, of course, use concolic analysis type approaches to use the strengths of both static analysis and dynamic analysis. And some of the things I'm going to talk about are in the vein of, of concolic analysis, where you, you run the program, and you have some inputs which you say are symbolic. And then you use, for instance, some sort of um, prover to deduce more inputs which you feed to the program or more paths that you run through the program. And so that has the advantage of having both the ability to reason precisely about the program execution, but not being limited to that. But I think, in general, we can talk about not just the some arbitrary input that we feed to the program. That's what often we do. And instead, work with the test suite to get some more broad view of what the program is supposed to actually do. And so I'm going to talk about a bunch of related projects, which I think exemplify the, the notion of things that you could potentially do using program inputs, right? So one example is um, Phantom, which is this PHP analysis by um, New Suter and Kunchak. And so PHP is, in many ways, a terrible language. Um, right? Uh, I don't really need to talk about how terrible it is. But um, the idea here is that a lot of the program behavior is going to depend on the configuration inf information, which you read from a text file, right? And so it's really hard to do some sort of static analysis. In this case, it's a static type analysis, which you think you really want your language to guarantee. But it's really hard, because you don't know what it's actually going to be until you run the program. So it's a two-phase approach where you run the program, you look at what the configuration information actually is going to be like, and then you at least know what the program is going to do in executions that are, in some sense, similar. And that's not that scientific, I guess, but you can you can at least say that if the, the behavior is similar to this one, then you know that it's, it's going to be free of type errors. And so that's one approach. A related approach for in, in the context of Java is, OK, so you have reflection, and you have dynamic class loaders. And 
So you have these benchmarks, and they actually use them. So if you do a naive analysis, a naive static analysis of them, then you just either miss all of the classes that you load, or you get all of the classes in the program. Each, either of these cases don't get you very good static analysis results, and it's also hard to transform the program. So again, once again, you run the program, and you observe which classes are loaded, and you use that information to then do a, a good static analysis. So there's been a bunch of work where you actually run the program, from what I can tell, you don't really run the program in any organized way over the test suite that the program gives you. You just run it on a couple of inputs, and you see what happens. And so that's better than nothing. You get good information, um, but maybe it's not the best information you could possibly get. Um, a couple more related projects. There was this um, paper in VMKai this year, uh, dependent array type information from tests. But it's actually, once again, it's tests where they just manufacture some input and they run that as one test input. It's not really running it through the, the test suite that the program comes with. So in that case, it was learn quantified array invariance. And so you guess some templates, you run it with some simple random tests. So you just, you have an array and you just generate random values for the array. And then you generate constraints and then you validate types based on that work. Um, another earlier work was, this is in some sense closest to what I have in mind. Um, Salner and uh, Smaradakis, and it's the DSD crasher. And the approach here was that you have your program, and then you run tests, and you infer a spec using DICON. And so then you get this inferred spec, and then you search for a bug. So you have the spec, and you look for violations of that spec. And then you generate a new test, and then you run the test and confirm that you actually indeed found a crash in the program. And so here what we have is we have the tests really involved in the running the program part of the, the, uh, the workflow. Okay. So that's what I wanted to say about the general work, the related work in the context of running the program and seeing what you can observe from the program. Now in this part of the, of the talk, I'm going to switch a bit and I'm going to talk about one particular analysis that I did on the test suites. Um, it's related to what I talked about before in the sense that we're looking at test suites. It's not quite where I want to go yet with the general um, part of the work where we use a test to find out more about the program. That's more of a thing that I think that I should be doing in the future. This is more of something I did in the past. But I'm going to tell you about what we can do with test suites. And so we'll, we'll see that. And first of all, let's look at some test suites. So there are some empirical studies which talk about what, I looked at these programs and looked at the tests, and so it's like, what are the tests like? Most of the tests are actually pretty simple, and so that's useful in if you're going to be designing analyses for these tests. So uh, there is these Java programs, and I use the number of asserts as some sort of measure of complexity, and so what you can see is that the percent is down there, and so most of these tests have 70% of test methods in these tests with less than five asserts. So they're actually going to be pretty straightforward. But they're not all just straight line code. And so we like analyzing code that actually has loops and branches in some sense. And so most tests do not have loops and do not have branches, but there is a sizable minority of tests which do. And I'll show you some test code that actually has them to understand how these actually show up in, in test code as well. Okay, so what the, the actual work, you gotta say something you actually did instead of just saying, yeah, this is a great idea, right? So I'm going to talk about some of the work I actually did, and this work is in detecting similar test methods, and the idea here is that, let's, let's tell a story. So I think I did a search on the internet, um, writing test cases or something, and then it's like, this is the picture that came up from Wikipedia. It's like this programmer writing test cases in JUnit or something like that. Um, okay, so this programmer is writing a bunch of related classes, and already in the program there is a foo widget, and there is a bar widget, and because this programmer is working at a place where they have good tests, there's also already existent tests for foo widget, so there's a good set of tests here, and there's also a good set of tests for bar widget as well. Okay, now the task of the programmer is to write baz widget, all right, so of course, you have to write the code for Baz widget. I'm not going to talk about that. But 
the task of the programmer also then is to write the tests for Baz widget. All right, so we have these tests for foo widget, and we have these tests for bar widget, and now they're both widget things, and now we're trying to write tests for Baz widget. So how are we gonna write these tests? Let's see, let's see, what's, what's the first thing you reach for if you're a programmer and you're trying to write these tests? That's right, control C, control V, right? We've, we've done it. If you've written tests, you have probably written tests using cut and paste, or copy and paste, I guess, is what you want. And it's not even necessarily a bad thing because tests are self-contained in JUnit. And we're writing tests for something that's similar, so it actually makes a lot of sense to start at least from a point where you know something works. But of course, it's a general problem of cut and paste code. You have these things, and they're similar, but they're not quite the same. And you have changes, and they don't keep track of the original thing. So it can be diff difficult to comprehend or maintain later. So the purpose of this particular work is to find methods that are similar and potential candidates in particular for, for test refactoring. And in fact, people have thought a lot about refactoring tests. There's, you can find this 800 page book, which is like, this is how you refactor tests. So people, some people really care about refactoring tests and that could reduce long-term maintenance cost or you know, it's just better for tests, right? There's techniques to do that as well. You can use standard language level techniques or you can use JUnit extensions to, to write better parameterized tests as well. Um, okay, but let's, let's briefly look at what that looks like in practice. <coughs> so we have two tests here. We have a test, test nominal filtering, and we have a test, test string filtering. And it turns out that these tests are pretty damn close, right? So you have this test, get um, test, test nominal filter, and it says get the nominal filter, and then it checks the result for being nominal. And then you have the test, get test string filtering. And it's exactly the same, except instead of using attribute.nominal, it uses attribute.string. And then here it checks again for attribute not equal string. And incidentally, I said, yeah, sometimes tests have loops, and this is an example where we have a test that has a loop, right? So it, it just iterates through something and checks that all the, all the things have that property. So the obvious refactoring that you might do is to use another loop and say, look, we have these four types of filters, and we should really iterate through them instead. And so this is real code. And, you know, somebody actually wrote these four tests as independent tests, and you could also write these tests as one test and refactor, uh, parameterize over that as well. And so maybe that's a better thing. It's certainly a better thing in some circumstances. Um, so the thing that I'm talking about today is this thing that we invented called assertion fingerprints, and it's, it's sort of ad hoc technique that we invented to look for similar tests um, using some heuristics. And so we have the technique and we looked at it and how it worked on, on some, some, some benchmarks. And so to understand how, how these work, let's think about how we actually usually write test cases. And um, so usually what happens is that there's four parts, which some of which may be missing, but you set up the test, then you exercise the system under tests, um, what it does, and then you verify that you get the right results and then you do teardown. And what we're going to do in the assertion fingerprint um, approach is we're gonna look at the verify phase and we're going to say that tests that have similar verify phases are going to be similar. And so yeah, that's the, that's the insight in this part of the work. Similar tests are going to have similar sets of asserts. And this is a heuristic, so of course, you know, okay, so it's not science in some sense, but it, it, it works well. And so what we do is we look at the asserts and if they have similar sets of asserts. So for instance, this test, test one, has these three asserts here. This test, test two, has these three asserts here. And they have asserts of the same kind on the same types. And so we group together all the tests that have the same sets of asserts with, which we call assertion fingerprints. We are going to actually augment it using the types, of course, as well as some control flow information about each assert. And so then we group together the ones that are similar. Here I've put them in colors and shapes. So you know, let's say you have these three asserts and we're gonna say they're gonna make up one set of assertion fingerprints. I'm gonna group these two, they're gonna make another set. And then this yellow one is all by itself in its own set. And we're gonna say, 
So developer, you should go look at these, and you might want to consider refactoring them if you think that they're actually amenable to refactoring. So we have some heuristics. Um, so we just look at various control flow characteristics of each assert. So you look at each assert, and you look at a bunch of its characteristics. So here's some code, which we have a control flow graph of. And things we look at are, for instance, whether an assert happens to be in a branch or not. And so the intuition here is that if you have an assert that's just running unconditionally versus an assertion that's running under some condition, then you probably want to differentiate them. And you don't want to group them together. And so for instance, here, we have the, uh, the statements here that are in a branch. Um, and then if you have a statement, this statement, it's going to be in two branches. So we just keep that, um, that measurement around as one of the properties of the assertion. We have other related, uh, so there's an actual definition, the minimal number of branches needed to reach a certain node. Um, so we keep the other, the dual of that also, how many merges you need to get to a node. So um, once again, if you're outside this, this branch, then you're probably likely to be different from a assertion that's inside the branch. And so for instance, here we've merged to so increase the merge count by one from this uh, from this branch. So basically, it's just control flow fingerprints of each assertion. Um, there's a definition, and then there's three other things. There's whether or not an assertion is in a loop or not in a loop. So that's going to be likely to be different as well. And so here we put a loop um, here, and so we set the in loop flag to be true, and try, empirically we determine this to be important. If a assertion is within a try block, it's likely to be different. And uh, dually, if it's inside a catch block, it's likely to be different. And so we keep all of these numbers for each assertion, and then we look for test methods which have the same fingerprint and say that they're likely to be similar. Uh, we also put some ad hoc filters as well, because otherwise you get some sets which are not so useful. So we say we only care about methods which have one of the following. They have some control flow, or they have at least four assertions, or they have tests which are on different assertion types. And so we have a system where we take a bunch of tests, we feed it to the SUT uh, program analysis framework, we get control flow graphs, and then we compute assertion fingerprints, and then we group these assertion fingerprints together to suggest to the developer similar test methods. So we have some benchmarks. And so once again, like this is the picture that I showed you at the beginning. We can see here from the numbers, there are significant numbers of lines of test code. Um, they make a substantial fraction of the total number of lines of code in the program. And so what we can see is that we have our analysis and it runs in some reasonable time. So usually in dozens of seconds. Uh, it's a, it's a intra-procedural analysis, so it'll run quite quickly. There's you know, just nothing too complicated going on here. And then we detected reasonable numbers of refactoring candidates. I mean, they're sort of really large numbers of refactoring candidates, um, depending on which benchmarks. And so we have from 16% of the methods belong to some set of um, refactoring candidates to 55% of the methods which belong to some set of refactoring candidates. Um, we also looked at the distribution of these methods. So there are some sets that are quite large. So we have some sets that have like 80 assertions and we have some sets that have 200 methods. So we actually looked at those. Um, and we looked at true positives. So we were like, okay, we're gonna sample all of these results and see how likely it is that, you know, are these tests actually similar and might you refactor them? There's some subjectiveness here. But uh, the, the, um, the blue bar is you have a set that's reported by, by our analysis and we think all of the methods in the set are similar. The orange part is the methods for which there's two sets of similar things. So there's two disjoint, at least two disjoint sets of similar things in the method. And the things that are not either blue or orange are things that are just false positives that are our system reports. <coughs> uh, 
so we looked at the actual results and we're like, okay, what's going on here? So we usually get decent results. Um, sometimes it doesn't work so well. For instance, you get small and heterogeneous tests that are unlikely to be false positives. Um, but on the other hand, sometimes it works quite well, like in Jota time, where you have this hierarchy. So you have, for instance, calendar, and you have Gregorian, Gregorian calendar, you have Julian calendar, you have Egyptian calendar or whatever. And so you have this wide hierarchy. It's kind of like the example I showed earlier, where you have all these things that are related, and then you have similar tests on all these things that are related. So you probably should refactor them. Uh, there's sometimes, each, in fact, even textually identical clones of methods with similar data types, but different environment setups. And so they may sometimes be amenable to refactoring as well. We also compared to clone detection, but I didn't show the, uh, the results here. Um, I said that we cared about um, exceptions because tests also show you exceptions. And that's actually something that we often kind of you lied when we were doing Fourier analysis. They're like, oh, there's some like exceptions, but we'll just not think about them because they're too hard. Tests, good tests will actually show you exceptions and what the program is supposed to do in these exceptions. And so you can use that as well to, um, to better understand what the program is supposed to do if you have a good set of tests. Um, sometimes it doesn't work well. For instance, these tests for, um, for Google visualization, just like, okay, here's this query, it's some text, and then we're going to run this query and see what the result is that we get. And so it's like, okay, fine. That our, our test detection method, similar test detection method doesn't work so well there. Um, so what we found was that we found a bunch of test methods that were, um, that had structural similarities and likely amenable to refactoring. But uh, also there were some non-parametrized and small methods that were difficult to refactor as well. Um, okay. So that's what I wanted to say about the, um, the test refactoring work. So the next step would be to guide the developer through test refactoring. So some sort of user interface, some sort of automatic refactoring that we can do based on these results. All right, so now back to the part where I talk about why tests are cool and why we should do analysis based on tests. So future perspectives. And so let's, let's step back again and think about our usual interaction with tests. So you have some software and you're writing this software, and then you use your test for various reasons. For instance, you make this change, and you want to see if your software still works after you make the change, or if you broke the software. So what you're going to do is you're going to make the change, and then you're going to run the test again. So as a developer, that's what you do. And you run the test again, and you get this yes, no answer. So this is a useful use for tests, but it's not all that we can do. Um, what I, what, that, that, the, that point shouldn't be at that, that particular point in the, the presentation. Um, what I mean to say is, you know, if you run the test, um, so as a developer, what you do is you, you run the test and you get this yes or no answer. As a static analysis person, what you will usually do is you will usually forget about the tests because, you know, they don't exist and just run the program through the analysis tool and then we get either directly some reports or we might generate some new tests. Okay, so now we have some more tests that we can continue to ignore or we can run and see what happens and then continue to ignore them. Uh, but usually what happens most often is we just ignore the tests that are in the program, although they could potentially tell us a lot about the program. <coughs> in dynamic analysis, you can't just completely ignore all tests because you have to have some input to the program. So what usually happens is that you have your program and you pick one or two test cases which somehow should exercise the functionality of the program, you hope. And then what you're going to do is you're going to run your program through the analysis tool with the tests as input. And then maybe again, you also find some issues with your program or maybe again, you generate tests. But my point here is that usually the tests are going to be right only with respect to the tool, right? So they're only a source of output. They're not usually a source of input in any meaningful way. And what I'd like to advocate for is an approach where the tests and the program are both input to the analysis tool. And then you might generate tests or you might do whatever else you do with the program. And <coughs> so to think about, or to, to, to provide some reasons why I think this is a good idea, um, I think that if you think about what good test suites are going to do, 
good test suites are going to take some substantial amount of effort to put the system into a state where you can verify the behavior. So that, that can be hard because in particular, you try to run a small part of the program and you're trying to understand what that does and you have to set up some sort of context for that. And we actually go through a lot of effort to, to make sure that we have just a part of the program that we can analyze and the test does that for us as well. And as I said earlier, the test, a good test is going to decide what the right answer is as well. And that's also a very useful hint for static analysis. We don't have to just restrict ourselves to these totally generic properties of, of, um, of programs, like it doesn't crash or it doesn't do something bad. No, we have some idea about what the right answer is if the developer sat down and thought about what the right answer is. Right? So we should be somehow using that information in static analysis as well. <coughs> Unit tests also illustrate interesting points in the program execution space, right? So when we do static analysis, we of course explore all the points in the execution space of the program. Uh, sometimes that's hard, sometimes you want to actually refine the, the execution space in some way, you want some good predicates. And these tests give you hints about spaces that the, the developer thought was interesting for, for looking at these tests, right? So they, they can be useful there as well. And as I said, they provide a complete execution environment for program fragments as well. So in particular, they're going to run just one part of the program if they are unit tests, right? So that, that can be useful as well. Uh, some other challenges that I thought about, so we have unit test suites and they contain thousands of tests. Maybe you want to combine information about from test runs in some way. You can concatenate this information, that's one thing you can do but maybe there's some sort of better way of concatenating this information or combining information than simply concatenation. And what can we learn from failing tests? Failing tests are in general a problem and there's two kinds of failing tests that are problems. There's a kind of test that fails sometimes but not all the time and those are especially bad because it's hard to deal with them in some sort of sensible way. And um, there's also tests which now no longer say what the program did does but they say what the program used to do and maybe it's useful to look at these tests as well. So what I want to advocate is when we're doing research in static and dynamic analysis, maybe we can go beyond just test generation and just generating a test and then running these tests and seeing what happens. We can use tests that the developer provided as a valuable source of information about the programs that they're associated with. Thanks for staying till the end. Uh, so I have a question exactly on your last point. Uh, you generate a lot of tests and obviously you looked at a lot of test suites. Uh, have you uh, discovered something interesting about the test coverage? And I'm referring to basic block coverage, eight, eight edge coverage, or even fragment coverage. It doesn't say that much. Like if you talk to people who actually like use tests, they're like, yeah, we try to hit 80% and then we don't care anymore. Okay, so noth nothing interesting. No. Okay. I, that's one thing I kind of thought about mentioning, but I decided not to. Coverage, in some sense, like we talk about it a lot academically, but in the real world, people don't seem to care much about that. Yes. So it's not only academic. Yeah, so sometimes mandated by, by standards. Uh, it seems that when it's not mandated by standards, people are happy to have 80%, and then they're like, okay, this is good enough. So you said that loads of uh, tests can tell you loads of things about the program. And imagine that you come to a new company and, and, and you start to read through the code. Uh, nowadays, loads of companies use this clean code where they don't use that much documentation, but the names are the documentation and the tests are the documentation. So your fingerprints can kind of uh, tell you which tests kind of are similar to each other. And maybe that might also help you to be able to learn about a code faster. Yes. Uh, so could you comment on that? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, so you can certainly use these tests as a sort of clustering mechanism, and then you might understand, you know, there's these kind of bunch of tests that do something similar, and so you just need to understand one of them, and then you understand this other sort of test as well uh, in terms of understanding another thing that the program does. So you could certainly use it as some sort of functionality grouping of, of the program behavior. Hi. Uh, in your... Um opportunity perspective. So do you 
mean end-to-end -end test or unit test. And if you think about unit test, then in many of these unit tests, people is using mocking. So they are actually injecting codes and so that the program is no more that program. It's another program. So how, how would you comment on this? So I think unit tests are particularly useful in terms of doing some sort of analysis of the program. And in particular, we spend a lot of effort trying to understand, like, you know, we try to have some sort of modular um, understanding of the program. And the, the unit tests where you in inject mocks are useful for having some sort of understanding of a model of the program. Of course, you also always have to be clear, this is not what the program really does. This is what the program does under some idealized situations. So I think there's also a lot of room for using the end-to-end -end test as well. And usually you'll have both tests. You, you, any system that, that is actually tested will have both unit tests and end-to-end -end tests. Uh, so you mentioned in, during the last part of your talk about uh, you mentioned fail, failing tests. Have you looked at those? Those are those telling you something about what a program should do and doesn't do? Uh, do you uncover bugs, uh, new bugs or old bugs? I have not yet looked at failing tests. I think they're an opportunity to learn something interesting about the program. But sometimes they're just yeah. Sometimes they're good and sometimes they're not good. That's that's all I can say unfortunately right now. Um, okay. But I think they can be interesting. So I, I really like this idea of, of learning more functional specs from the, from the tests. This is really cool. I mean, I guess the, the obvious remark is, of course, you only get as much information as people thought of when they wrote the tests. And if there are bugs that aren't covered by any of the test cases, then of course you don't see those behaviors. Yes. So, I mean, would something, would it possibly work to say, now you take this information that you learn from the tests, you do your static analysis based on this, base, and you have some hypothesized functional specification now for the code. So now you find perhaps that you can't verify that specification. Could you now translate the counter examples basically to more tests? Could you say, well, now here is a scenario that you can present back to the programmer. So you, you get all the setup code and this kind of thing. And then basically ask, I mean, you don't know whether your spec is right, right? So you don't want to say, well, here's a failing test. Instead, you kind of want to say, I'm not sure, essentially, hey, what what's do you going expect? On, right? what, 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 what should I, this is great, right? Because you, you, you tell the programmer, if you tell the programmer some sort of like vague thing about you know, how does your program behave, they'll just ignore you, I think. Whereas if you tell them, OK, I do x, y, and z, what should the program do now? It, right. th is, is this right? I think that's a very accessible way to talk to the programmer about what the system is supposed to do. I so think this would be cool to give them a kind of shape, like a, a skeleton of a test and say, firstly, you don't cover this behavior yet in your test suite. Yeah. And secondly, it's not clear what's supposed to happen. Yeah, so I, uh, I talked about test generation, right? And it's like, often we stop there. We shouldn't stop there. We should continue from the generated test and use that as we should, we should close the, the, the loop, right? Yeah, that sounds really cool. Thanks. Like, it's, uh, this is all like, you know, like vaporware, right? So it can be anything you want. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, th let's thank, thank Pat Patrick again. So this was the last talk of the workshop. Um, a uh, few things before we conclude. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, you know, all the speakers and all the attendees for coming here. I hope you guys had fun and learned something interesting. Uh, and also, I'd like to thank Mar Marlias Weizert, who is sitting on the back, who did a lot of the organization, if not most of the organizations, associated with the workshop. So, some applause for her. <laughs> so, uh, please, for all the speakers, please send us the slides, and uh, there will be a video uh, posted online shortly. If you object to the video, please send us an email as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so, send us the PDF slides, preferably in, in PDF form if not in PowerPoint. Uh, for those of you who are interested in dinner or, or staying here, a uh, scheduling something later on, please stay here and we'll coordinate something. So this concludes the workshop. Thank you very much and um, hope you had fun.